Ready, uh, go for launch. Five. Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Anything can happen in the next half hour. Four. My friend, we cannot keep this a secret any longer. This whole thing is insane. Three. Quiet, please. I am analyzing. Where's the kaboom? Two. There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. One. chapter in the incredible ape saga. There it is, our wars. This is the hell my forefathers used to speak about. This background radiation alone will give us 300 rentgens an hour. The battlefield, a dead city 12 years after the ultimate bomb has been dropped. The prize, the right to inherit what's left of the earth. The contestants, ape against man. The most unbelievable showdown ever filmed. As the mutants, strange, transformed men who live underground like moles, battle the apes to decide who will be master and who will be slain. They're getting away. Kill them. We who survive will create a new race. In the aftermath of his victory, the surface of the world was ravaged by the vilest war in human history. Climaxing the epic series which made motion picture history comes the last, the most spectacular of all the ape adventures. No! Fight, like Out of the forbidden city they roared to settle once and for all who had the right to rule the planet, ape or man. Greetings, my fellow galactic travelers, and welcome back to Planet 8. This is your mission commander, Larry, speaking to you from our hidden base. Chief Engineer Bob is here by my side, as always, in the command center, and circling Planet 8 in our orbital spy satellite is Reconnaissance Officer Karen. And on this episode of Planet 8, your intrepid crew is joined once again with our good friend, Lord Bloodraw. We're going to be taking a deep dive into the battle for the planet of the apes. Straight away, let's kick it up to the satellite. Walker, take it away. All right. Thank you, Larry. Well, this is kind of momentous for us because we've been doing these reviews of all of the original battle, I mean, Planet of the Apes films now for, uh, I think, every year of the podcast. Can that I be I believe true? once, at least once a year, yeah. Yeah. So uh, finishing off the original five films, kind of a big deal here. And of course, we've had Lord Blood Raw with us for, <laughs> for every film, thank, thankfully. <laughs> and now everybody can go first. eight with Planet Eight. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Listen to the Apes marathon. Was my, first, my first geek love. That's right. Before track before horror, it was Planet of the Apes. It mm -hmm. really, really fascinated me. Well, and it was sort of the first franchise, I think, and at least film wise, I, I guess. Well, you could maybe argue James Bond, but of of the genre, of right. the sci fi genre, certainly. So, uh, yeah, this is sort of a big deal here. Although, you know, it's. 
pretty much considered the least of the the five films, but we'll we'll give it a, a good go here today. And I think it has some things that uh, make it uh, enjoyable at the very at the very least. Oh. Um, so yeah, this film came out in uh, on June thirteenth, nineteen seventy three, and I know for me it was the first apes film I actually saw in a theater. I don't know about the rest of you. You youngin. I saw it in a drive-in. <laughs> Ah. Quite, quite kind of appropriately, I think. I think it's yeah. more of a drive-in film than the other than the other films in the series. But yeah, no, I was big into the Apes films, so I saw them all in the theater as they came out. I, I unfortunately, not fortunate, unfortunately, but I saw it on like dialing for dollars. I think was. Uh... <laughs> Pat McCormick. <laughs> Actually, I'll amend that. Uh, my parents took me and my brother to the drive-in to see Planet of the Apes, and mm. I fell asleep while they were walking through the desert and I woke up as we were driving out of the drive-in. So oh. I didn't actually get to see Planet of the Apes, which I was- oh, That wasn't a whole lot of action in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, but, uh, so, you know, wrapping up the, the series and they knew they were basically wrapping it up um, because they were kind of running out of steam on this. And so the the script writer the who had written most of the or I think most of the sequels right he Paul Dinn had been yeah. on certainly on Conquest and I think on Escape and did he also do Beneath? I, I believe so. Recall? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So he was going to work on this. He did create at least a a pretty elaborate treatment which I had not been aware of before, and I think. Lord Bloodraw may be aware of some of this. Um, I was relying on this really excellent book by Joe Russo, Larry Landsman, and Ed Gross. It's called Planet of the Apes Revisited. I highly recommend this book. And basically, I'll, I'll give you kind of my abbreviated rundown of what this original script treatment was, which was quite different from what we got. But... Uh, it picks up like 13 years after conquest. Caesar is ruling over um, an ape city, but the humans in this city are much more, um, they're treated much more like slaves than what we saw in the film. And uh, there's a council of eight apes that are under Caesar. So there's some chimps, there's some gorillas, there's some orangutans, um, and they're, you know, basically running the city. And then uh, this um, human scout from a city in the north is caught and uh, some communications ensue because he has a, a, some sort of a communications device. And the ruler of the city there, don't laugh, his name is Nimrod. <laughs> the ruler of the city threatens if his the scout's not released, he's gonna drop a nuke on Ape City. And so um, an ape city in this treatment is actually they've stayed in the city that was in conquest. So they're not out in the boonies. They're actually in a city. And so they take this very seriously. And Caesar's like, well, I'm not going to release him. And he's much more hard headed and tough in this, this script. And so they go into these bomb shelters. Some of them, they leave some of the humans out and they only take some key figures, some key humans with them. And um they actually do uh, nuke the the city. And so um, after this, Caesar starts having these headaches. Um, Lisa is pregnant. Um, there's a human spy that has worked his way into the, the compound. Um, Cornelius is born, but then this human spy switches these medications and it causes Lisa's death. Caesar goes kind of nuts. Um, he's going to have all the humans made mute. And then he <laughs> there's some weird stuff that goes on where they they um, use a device to make him hear Lisa's voice. And so and Lisa's voice is saying, don't make the humans mute and all this other wow. stuff. And yeah, it's really trippy. And so then he he races to um, make sure that McDonald is not made mute. Um, then there's a revolt, you know, that Aldo leads Aldo's on the council. And two other figures on the council, there's a chimpanzee named Pan, who's a pacifist, and an orangutan named Zeno, who is a uh, who is a, uh, eventually will become the lawgiver. 
And so they're trying to work against Aldo. Um, Aldo eventually shoots Caesar. Um, all kinds of insanity ensues. Um, the humans flee to the forest where eventually they will become the humans we see in Planet of the Apes. And then uh, uh, Cornelius, their kid, is taken back to the city, and we assume he will grow up and lead them. But yeah, it's a much more violent and um, <laughs> downbeat film than what we got. Good. So the yeah. author yeah. said, you know, here's your treatment for the film. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, 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 and Arthur P. Jacobs was like, no, we don't want to go with something this dark. You know, you need to rework it. But Paul Dane got sick. Yeah. And he was like, I can't work on it. So they brought in the uh, Corringtons, John and Joyce, who had written the script for The Omega Man and sort of were becoming known for science fiction, I guess, off of just one film. They'd also worked on some movies for Roger Corman, um, of which I am not aware which ones they were. But, you know, what I found interesting that. is they'd not watched one of the eight <laughs> films. When yes, they I, I had heard that. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I think they, they screened beneath for him, I think. So that was like it. Yeah, that is interesting, right? Why would you hire these? Well, they seem like, you know, good people, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they said they pretty much threw away everything from Paul Dane's script and kind of did their own thing. They saw the apes as being like innocents. And they, you know, wanted to do a story that was more sort of a Cain and Abel kind of thing with Caesar and Aldo. And um, yeah, there was more an incorporation of some of the themes from beneath, which I think tracks with uh, what you're saying, Bob, about them screening uh, beneath for them. And well, then after, I'm, I'm sorry, but after no, go Conquest, ahead, go ahead. after Conquest, which was very hard edged and violent, the studio was like, well, let's do something a little more family friendly. Right. By the time they started making Battle, they knew they were going to television. Exactly. So they knew they had to they had to kind of soften things a bit right. to kind of make the transition into television. So I would love to have seen the movie you described. <laughs> I know. Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to go to an alternate Earth and see oh, that? Film? Yeah. I know. I know. Like uh, one thing I had read, but I think this is actually in the treatment, like not that story, but the next treatment where. When they go to the city, and the city's obviously irradiated, and then Caesar actually gets radiation poisoning. Or not Caesar, Cornelius. <laughs> Caesar. 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 Caesar gets radiation poisoning. So when he comes back, he's losing his hair and all this. And Aldo basically says that he's becoming more human. You know, he's huh. becoming one of the humans because he's losing his fur and all that. But they cut that because of budget, obviously. They didn't want to make all these different masks and suits for Caesar where yeah. it was like less and less fur. Yeah. But um, yeah, I thought I thought that was interesting, but maybe a little too much for yeah, I mean they definitely wanted to go with the family slant. And then I had heard that Conquest was supposed to be the end. But it made some money, so then they did they decided, okay, we'll do the next one. Yeah. Well, that's the legacy yeah. of these Interestingly apes enough, was originally called Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the, the reboot. But then they changed it to battle at some point. But it's weird because it's not like a battle for the Planet of the Apes. It's like a battle for like three tree houses in a little clearing. Skirmish. <laughs> the minor skirmish. Skirmish, yeah. minor skirmish, for, the skirmish for the Planet of the Apes. Right, yeah. Right. But yeah, there's there's a lot of things. Well, we can get into that yeah, yeah. as we talk through the film. But yeah, so the Corringtons put together their script, which, you know, was much, much different. And then Paul Dane comes back in again uh, to do another rewrite. And so he claimed that he rewrote like 90 percent of the dialogue and then added some things. The ending is definitely his ending because that ending is much more 
um, dower with the statue and the tear and, you know, so it put it much more into doubt about whether, oh, yeah, they're going to get now we got another timeline and they're going to live together happily. It's like, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, this was the film that might have had a happy ending and then right at the end, it's like, nope. <laughs> None of these films have happy endings. Exactly. Apes, also, not, I think one of the apes have happy endings. like all the kids fighting, like the apes and the and the humans, just like mm-hmm. not like a battle for the planet, but you know they were just like you know like Playground at the end battle. of the film, you see the one ape child and the one human child kind of push each other type of thing. Right, right. This was supposed to be like a fight between the two sides kind of thing. We're, we're going to end it on a nice somber. Nope, ape will not kill ape unless they have to. <laughs> <laughs> but ape will kill Abe. So yeah, that is kind of how the uh, story got put together. Of course, as we've all noted here, uh, much less budget. Depending yeah. what you're reading, I, it's like. 1.2 million, maybe up to 1.8 million, but a lot less than any of the other films, which is why we get things like the school bus <laughs> and <laughs> some of the kind of obvious matte paintings and things like that. Well, I had what, heard that what, it was like like a you know, the budget had been declining every film, but yeah. then this one was like maybe a tick or so up from Conquest. Yeah, a little more than Conquest. Yeah. You had the one exploding treehouse film from multiple angles you just, you <laughs> explode like six or seven times right <laughs> yeah that you got to give it to the the director he really i mean he made it look bigger than it actually was i mean there was only so much he could do but he filmed it on a scale uh he filmed it in a way that gave it scale that yeah. obviously wasn't there oh yeah I agree. I think, yeah, for for the budget that he had, and you know, he made use of the actors. There were some very strong actors, obviously yes. Roddy McDowell, uh, but um, Andy Williams. I think this was his first credited. Uh, well, yes, the, oh, right, right. Andy Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a bear with some cookies in the background. <laughs> that was an alternative universe version we were talking about. <laughs> yeah, Paul Williams did a very good job in that. Yeah, very yeah. good job. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, uh, and there was also a story where he was going to go on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and uh, he was filming that day. And you can look this up on YouTube. It's actually on YouTube. Mm-hmm. He's filming that day, and then he decided he was be- going to be cutting it too close. So he grabbed one of the makeup artists, and he went on The Tonight Show in his ape makeup. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Doc Severinsen knew about it, but Johnny didn't. And so he came out, and he sang he sang a song and all that, and Johnny's just cracking up through the whole thing. But... <laughs> yeah. He uh, he's in one of my favorite films, The Phantom of Paradise. Also, yes, yeah. yeah. Didn't he write the music for that? I I believe so. This was before. Phantom of yeah, it was, it was before. Yeah, yeah. He was writing. He was writing some songs for some movies for uh, for 20th Century Fox at the time, and uh, someone had just asked him if he wanted to come by the set, and then one thing led to another. They asked him if he wanted to be an ape, and supposedly. He was a big fan of the film, so he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll be an ape. I'll do it." And he got a pretty good, pretty good role out of it. Yeah, he really did. He really did. Yeah. And Claude Akins as Aldo does a great oh, job. Yeah. He does a good job. It's yeah. kind of a, oh, he's not like the smartest guerrilla general we've ever seen, but <laughs> no. he's he's really motivated. He's got some grit. He's really motivated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a far cry from Ursus, but yeah, yeah, yeah he's really motivated. And then you've got what John Houston is the lawgiver. John Houston. That's like, why, why is he here? And I, I watched it. <laughs> such a uh, small role, too. I mean, really, I mean, right? it's an important role. And yeah, he's in you know the beginning and the end. But well, he has that great voice, mm-hmm. which, you know, you can recognize. And I watched a clip with um, John Landis, who we can also discuss. And he said, you know, he was sitting at a table. They had a break and they were eating. And there was this orangutan at the end of the table reading, you know, and he was just like, 
not paying any attention to him. And then a assistant came up and said, uh, Mr. Houston, we're ready for you. And he's like, what? <laughs> you know, like, that's John Houston. And he talked to him later and he was sort of like, well, what are you doing here? And he's like, kid, you take the money. <laughs> I was like, take the money where you can get it. Yeah. <laughs> Just so surprising that he would be in a film like that. But yeah, he he's another one of those things that just adds a little bit of something extra to this film, which really yeah. needs it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It adds gravitas. I mean, you know, you've got, you've got that voice and him being, you know, the lawgiver reading the, it's, it, it works. It really works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was and thinking about having that Caesar statue there at the end mm. and in the beginning and whatever is supposedly in one of the drafts, it was supposed to be inferred that, Caesar was actually the lawgiver. Like mm. the statue was Caesar all along. Mm. But, but obviously the first lawgiver statue did not look a whole lot like a chimp. But. No. <laughs> well, what is, who, has, who has those original statues if they if they still exist? Sitting in someone's collection or you know, Bob and I get a lot of those Halloween animatronics. I'd love to have a Zira animatronic for halloween hello bright eyes <laughs> okay maybe we need to veer the conversation back to the movie oh, sorry um, <laughs> so um the director f lee j lee thompson sorry also did conquest um Interesting that, yeah, he had much less to work with here. And I know he was not very pleased with the, the final results of this either. I mean, and you can look at it and say, yeah, Conquest is a, a much better film, okay. you know. Well, didn't they sign him up with, with no script and he agreed? And then he said something well, like, well, I'll never do this again. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, what about the story? I mean, what do we, what do we think about this I mean, we come in either, and here's another thing. It's either 27 years since conquest, which is what Mandemus says, or it's 12 years, which right. is what one of the mutants says. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it, it, Mandemus says he's lived in the armory for 27 years, but the yeah. mutants says, doesn't he say it's 12 years since the bomb? Was it the bomb? That's what, I thought? Yeah. That's what I thought. So I thought, okay, so maybe maybe there's a difference. Of, there's a difference in time there. The, so yeah. it could have been 27 years later, which would make Caesar in his 40s, right? Because he was 18 in Conquest. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, right. but what? 27 years, fine. But in 27, let's say let's say it's 27 years. In 27 years, the apes went from not speaking to having Virgil talk about temporal temporal physics. <laughs> <laughs> and dressing like the apes from the original film. Yeah. Right. That was that was a blow. Because in in um well, it's definitely a, a different timeline because in mm -hmm. Escape, when Cornelius is talking about the history of his people, it's 700 years. Yeah. between the virus that kills all the cats and dogs and the apes taking over. And in this, it's 27 years. <laughs> yeah, but I know with this one, too, it was yeah. supposed to originally, it was supposed to kind of bring it full circle. Yeah. yeah. So, that, so well, they're, back to where Earth was at the beginning of Planet of the Apes. Right. They're, they're, fry, they're flying free and loose with continuity on this one, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And it's only your intrepid crew, with Lord Blood Raw, that cracks these continuity. <laughs> I really care about this stuff. <laughs> really, we're the only people who overthink this stuff so much. <laughs> hey, that's part of the fun of watching these films, though. I mean, you you watch them oh, like yeah. fifty times, and it's like, oh wait a minute, John Landis. What? Mm -hmm. Where? <laughs> Where? I, lo I looked a couple of times. I went back and I this morning I watched the little extended cut, which is only 45 minutes long. I wish they had just broken it up into scenes you could mm. hop through, but it's sort of this weird, like, 
one long extended scenes. Um, and I still couldn't catch a glimpse of him unless he really looked very different. I saw an interview with him and he was saying that most of his scenes hit the cutting room floor. Yeah. He's just a, I read. a little scene like in the background somewhere. Right. He's in the mm -hmm. corral. It's like a blink and you'll miss it type of yeah, thing. Yeah, he's still got a credit, but um got yeah. credit. Yeah, you got a major credit, but yeah, Jake's and it, friend. And it... oh. Jake's friend. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, this this is my it's kind of it's one of those comfort films, you know, not not deep at all. It doesn't leave you with any kind of um, it doesn't leave you with a lot to think about. It's just a fun kind of a TV movie version mm -hmm. of an apes film. But it is just fun. And it's always great to see the apes and see them interacting. And uh, I thought there was really good chemistry between. Roddy McDowell and Paul Williams. Yeah. yeah. Vir Virgil and yeah, Caesar. Uh, Virgil was uh, just this interesting, I guess you could call him an orangutan nerd, right? <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, yeah. he was uh, he was an orangutan science nerd. Well, Paul Williams, I was seeing an interview with him. He was saying that when he first got there, he went into the makeup trailer and he sat down and Roddy McDowell was on one side and Claude Akins was on the other. And he was just like starstruck. Wow. Like, oh my God, Rod Roddy McDowell and Claude Akins. And it's like, I don't think any of them really spoke that first time. Well, he said Roddy would usually just like put his head back and fall asleep while they put the makeup on. So yeah. Probably he was the best very talkative, you know. Yeah. But yeah. One thing John Landis said about working on the film is he was supposed to be um his servant but he was in charge of watching cornelius and oh. roddy mcdowell would never let him forget that he was playing as, in, a, in a very kidding way but he was right. very uh jokingly uh you know would constantly joke about him being being his servant and, you know. <laughs> yeah. well have John, you guys seen that uh documentary making apes yes yeah. yes very good i rewatched it last night and yeah, Bobby Porter, who played Cornelius, he had a whole thing where he was he was looking at Roddy McDowell's makeup, and he's like, "There's something different about his makeup. I don't I don't know what it is, you know." So he was like being made up, and he told the makeup guy, "He's like, can you make my makeup more like Roddy's? It's like he's more expressive. He can do things." And the guy's like. That's a big, that's like top secret. He goes, if you can get Roddy McDowell to tell you the secret, then I'll do it. So he went and talked to Roddy McDowell and Roddy McDowell said that when he <clears throat> originally got the makeup, he hollowed out the nose. And so he was able to like crinkle the nose. <laughs> that's how he got more expressive. He goes, tell him, go back and tell him to hollow out the nose because Bobby Porter's whole thing is like, I'm playing your son. I should have some similar characteristics to you. Yeah. And so they decided that would be the characteristic. So he's like, yeah, just go and tell him to hollow out the nose and then you can do that. So there's one scene where they're talking and Roddy McDowell does the nose crinkle thing. And then it cuts over to Bobby Porter as Cornelius. And then he does it to like, does it back. So it was kind of, Behind the scenes of the makeup of, of cool. the planet of the apes. But if you haven't seen Making Apes, it's, it's a really good documentary on it really is. Yeah. basically on how they made the makeup and how they developed everything. Mm -hmm. Hey, is it just me? You know, Mr. Man Tears here. I, I didn't really feel the the loss of of Caesar's son. You know, when he's having that little speech with him and saying, "Father." you know, yada, 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 and then fade to black. <laughs> I, I felt his rage when he goes after Aldo and, you know, <laughs> doing all his thing and stuff, but I don't know. And I'm not taken away from the from the actor who played the kid, but it just, something just didn't happen there. Well, I think there was what definitely more of an emotional impact in Escape. You know, when... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely you know, when he gets shot and then i guess it's probably because they shot a baby too but uh yeah. 
there's definitely more of an emotional impact in that one than there is in that one. But what'll yeah. happen is whenever there's a sad scene in a movie or or like Mandalorian, uh <laughs> Jasmine like looks over, I don't know why, to see if I'm crying, you know. <laughs> and so the the kid dies and and she's like, I just smile at her. I'm just like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> You know, again, season two, Grogu touching the Mando, I've just ugly cried, but this one is just like, okay, next. Well, man, this is your rating system now. You will have like, <laughs> Grogu at a five. This is a one. Things in between. Or I, I see. See. It could be like that episode of Cheers. <laughs> where Norm is like, he Norm gets the job where he, his job is to fire everybody. And he got the job because every time he would fire someone, he'd cry and, and all emotional. And then he, uh, <laughs> towards the end of the episode, he fires a guy and he doesn't cry. And the guy's like, well, aren't you going to cry? And he's he's like trying to force it. And he's like, oh, you know. So it's kind of empty. You cried so much <laughs> that now you yeah. can't even force it. <laughs> they had two interesting cast replacements, in a sense. Um, the obvious one was Harry Rhodes didn't come back for McDonald's. So then they have, oh, it's McDonald's brother. Yeah. <laughs> and he brought in Austin Stoker. And it's like, he just conveniently like kind of knows everything that McDonald would know. <laughs> like, oh, we can go into the archives under the city and blah, blah, blah. It's like, Okay, sure. It, it, it was very just... convenient. He could still call him McDonald. <laughs> yeah. did, it just so happened he worked in the same building as his brother. So yeah, yeah. it's right. It's, yeah, yeah. Was, and he's a youngish guy. So if it's twenty-seven years, what was he like? Eighteen years? You know, he's just. It's it's like, and then it's that thing where like, just forget it. Don't think about it. Just let it go. <laughs> I was talking with some friends last night and they're like, well, you know, in this movie, this couldn't happen because this, and I'm like, shit, you guys are like Karen and Bob with those damn ants. And then, well, you know, the it's a movie. The, the ants' you know, legs would break. Tw 27 years, 12 months, just go with it. Aldo's <laughs> killing his kid. They also, um, <laughs> they couldn't get... Um, it was it Don Murray back to pay, play uh, Governor Brick? So then Severin Darden says, "Well, I'm right here. I'll play a bad guy. I was in that movie. I'm, 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 glad, in that movie. I'm glad of that. I think Severin Darden, um, really, I mean, character actor, but really known for his comedy skills, for his Im Im improvisational comedy. Weird, he's huh? like a star in improvisational comedy, and he brings something." to cope not only in this film, but in Conquest. In Conquest, it's much, much more of a cold bureaucratic, mm -hmm. you know, when, when he, when Caesar dies on the, there's about to die on the table, you know, what should I do with him? Well, he's, he's wired for electrocution, isn't he? Electrocute him. <laughs> you know, just that cold bureaucratic. And in this one, he's maniacal and has that uh, rage now against Caesar, whom he sees as destroying his planet. Yeah, he, he, I'm, 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 I mean, Murray, great actor and really um, brought um, a fascistic uh, uh, quality to Breck. As a matter of fact, I had read that he he was fluent in German. So he had he, he had the script, his lines translated to German. And he practiced them in German and then in his head during the performance did them in English to give it that that more clipped, you know, that uh, delivery, which is very interesting. He's a great actor, but I'm that glad that, uh, yeah, I'm glad that uh, Severn Darden played the villain in that. I think he, he was, uh, he was definitely one of the bright spots. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think and, yeah, as an audience, it kind of throws you off when you have you know an actor or a performer that's known for a certain kind of you know performance and then they they play the heel and it's it kind of like oh huh, okay but it, it kind of hurts a little more if you will you know what i mean well, usually he didn't do a lot of comedy films 
Severin Darden. I mean, the one before this film, the one I really remember him from is Werewolves on Wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Where he played, I believe he played a satanic priest. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he was one of the motorcycle gang. I think he was a satanic priest. Something like that. I don't, it's been years since I've seen that. Right. <laughs> well, I thought the other interesting thing, though, too, is when they go back and they watch the tapes of Zira and Cornelius, you know, being interrogated. And that's where Caesar finds out that it's the gorillas that cause, you know, the, mm -hmm. the downfall of man and all that. And then when he gets back, of course, Aldo and the gorillas are basically plotting to take over, you know. Aldo's basically, as soon as Cornelius dies and Caesar's kind of occupied over there, then Aldo's like, all right, martial law, I'm taking over. So, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, Caesar's kind of basically the gorillas that escalate the fighting with the, uh, with the humans in the, in the, in the movie. Caesar's a little oblivious at times in this. Uh, he seems kind of like he's reached a, a place where he's, um, coasting i don't know <laughs> like things have just been kind of going along and he's just like oh whatever it, 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 it was almost like a politician because it's like oh this is what i've seen this is what i and then you know his advisors advise him and then he sees it, it kind of played out like that to me you know and it's like it, it affected his judgment his you know well, decisions that he made but well, he kind of set up that whole society with apes and humans. And then it got to the point where I think it was kind of pretty much running itself. And he was kind of on cruise control mm -hmm. until yeah. until this happened. And you've got all these things he suddenly has to deal with. Right. You know, and then evil is evil. It doesn't matter if you're an ape or a human. You know, right. ape will not kill ape. Well, yeah, they will. Um, and actually, what? Of what useful information did he get by seeing that the tape of his parents? Yeah. Well, really, I think the really useful information does, right? was that the gorillas are the cause of everything. Yeah. Yeah, but he knows, okay, I have to maintain peace. I have to, you know, we're we're gonna work towards a more just society over time, which was his goal anyway. But then it's like, yeah, okay, now you've got now you know what happened, you know, what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> did yeah. did any of you see the extended cut on the, the Blu-ray? Yeah, that's the one I have seen. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting that in that extended cut, we get to see the Alpha Omega bomb. Yeah. And we, we know that those mutants, those people, I don't think they're really mutants yet. No, they're, just, they're the ancestors of the media. Yeah, they're just messed up at this point. But uh, they've, they've, they're the ones who have the bomb, and they're already starting to talk about how, you know, if we, we, we've got to respect this, we've got to venerate it, and you know, this is what will keep us safe. And you know, it's. I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't think the placement of that scene maybe would have worked, and that's probably why they cut it. But I think it. It was an interesting scene, and I I kind of wanted to see it in the movie. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, Men Mendez the first, and right. Mendez in beneath is Mendez the forty thousandth or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that scene that was a good scene. I wish they had put it in. I kind of fault the actor that played Mendez in that scene because it you get the feeling he doesn't believe a word he's saying. <laughs> That that's just my take on it. It's like he he's not he's just not delivering the lines believably, in in my opinion. It's not a great scene, but it would have been an important scene had it been done a bit better. Yeah, and he he really you know he talks about firing that thing over into Ape City, not realizing that it's going to wipe them out too. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I wonder. I wonder if Culp knew that it would kill everyone. I mean, I think he might have just been at that point mentally where he didn't care. Oh, Six hundred years later, it blew up a whole planet, right? Yeah. Well, they kind of figured that they were all dying 
anyway, right? Because there's that scene where Caesar and Virgil and McDonald are going by these bunks with people laying there looking like they're essentially dying. Well, and when they're charging on the city or they're marching towards the city, yeah. you see them like falling over. <laughs> it's right. like, this is not a potent army force, you know? Well, right. they all have the radiation poison. They've been living right. in the radiation for 12 or 27 yeah. years. Something like that. Yeah. So they figured he, he might have figured, you know, we'll be dead in a few more years anyway. Just if we don't come back, just uh, nuke the world. Yeah. Lost, lost opportunity for a sixth film, Planet of the Zombie Apes or the Ape Zombie. <laughs> Zombies are the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, somebody will be working on that. Well, now this this is a big uh uh tangent but the film tombs of the blind dead when that came out of have, have you seen that it's uh the knights templar come back as uh, basically zombies that. uh they're they're bearded they're blind because they were tortured to death had their eyes gouged out they come they come back to life again bearded in the robes and things and when that film came out in the United States, it did pretty well going to drive-ins. And as they very often did for foreign films, they retitled it Revenge of the Planet of the Apes. And they had this little this little thing at the beginning that said that, uh, you know, ape, apes had ruled the earth for thousands of years until finally there was a human uprising. All the apes were gathered were gathered up and tortured to death having their eyes gouged out now today the apes are coming back for revenge oh my god yeah someone beat me to that, it that little clip is on youtube that the beginning revenge uh, i believe it was revenge of the planet of the apes how amazing. funny amazing yeah yeah how funny. i'll have to look that up you gotta admire the uh chutzpah for a Lack of a <laughs> yeah, at least we got it in the episode who says we're not complete on this stuff that's right <laughs> I mean, this, damn it <laughs> we overthink this stuff so you don't have to <laughs> no and on that us. note this draws this episode. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to hear from don about that <laughs> <laughs> well i'm gonna have to definitely check that out that, fact, that is funny want, it's funny because if you watch Making of the Making of the Apes, Don has a couple pretty good scenes in that one. Oh, well, that is Don funny. Bishop, he's like in a couple, yes. at least a couple scenes there. Yes. Yes. Shout, shout out to Don. Right. Shout out to Don. As um, uh, I had the weirdest thought watching this too that when seeing the the mutant army air quotes, um, it's like very pre road warrior like low budget road warrior you know the little assemblage of vehicles and like the school bus because it's Definitely just had that feel it's mm -hmm. so it's so sad but you know it's sort of like the remnants of what they had left it, i was really like kind of hoping if they were or... go with school buses and all that that they put a few more spikes on them and things and yeah they'd have to <laughs> punk it up a little bit yeah. Had, had Karen and I done that Road Warrior film mockumentary uh, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> but our film was going to be about Lucha Libre and Aztec mummies. and uh, Yeah, I wish I still had the video. I don't know where that went. That was pretty good. We were filming around the Palace of Fine Arts. And, yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, well. Um, and in the extended cut, they show a lot more of... Aldo and his guerrillas attacking uh, Culp and his men inside the bus. It's a little more violent, but it's not oh. <laughs> conquest level violent. No. That was good. And my favorite. Yeah. Fight like apes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is cool because, they, you know, they're all just laying there like they're all dead and they lure all the humans in and then. Caesar's basically buying time until finally he tells everybody, you know, to get up and fight. He's getting back to his radical roots. Uh, right. Oldest trick in the book or newest trick in the book, depending on the timeline, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's what my point. friends were. 
coming up on a certain time mark that we're going to try to keep this episode within. Any last minute thoughts or comments we'd like to make on uh, this epic battle? I think that the the original um, cycle of the apes ended with this film, I mean, properly. From here, where are we going to go <clears throat> other than just tell more stories of that kind that I don't think they were necessarily going to go in the direction of because they already went with a more family-friendly version with this. And then right. after this, you've got the you go into the TV series, which was, again, more family-friendly, lighter, much more watered down than any of the other previous films. So mm -hmm. I think it was a fitting time to end the this cycle of the five original Planet of the Apes films. And it's a fun film. I, I, like right. I say, I saw it in a drive-in, and I think fittingly so, because of, of the all the Apes films, this was a drive-in movie. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Well said. Hmm. No, I I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's. I don't think you know that. I've never seen an apes film I don't like. I mean, <laughs> but as the original five, though, you know, I immensely enjoyed every single one, to you know a different degree. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we're here at the end of the first cycle, unless you. Unless you count the TV show and the uh, cartoon, but uh, which we will oh, eventually. <laughs> but I mean, definitely, I you know back back in the day, I never really did the whole go ape thing, and I saw all the apes films in the theater, but not all together in the go ape marathon that they promoted. So I'm um, gonna have to put one on anyway. But <laughs> I saw the Go Apes marathon in a drive-in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that must have been an all-nighter then. Oh yeah, an all-nighter. Wow. It ended pretty much close to dawn. Yeah. You yeah, get the badge of honor, Lord Blood Roth, the Apes <laughs> badge of honor. <laughs> it was. It was fun. It was. It was. Yeah, that was a fun night. Now, folks could take our podcasts of each episode they could watch the movie then listen to our corresponding episode then watch the next movie do the next episode and so on and really enrich their experience but we cheated though we did combine two we had escape and conquest as a double on one episode that's right we did a double a twofer picture. definitely a twofer but yeah. that's okay that keeps you from staying up all night there you go have I there been a part of all the Apes episodes? I don't I think, think so. so. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, th I think you have been. Wow. And, and you forever will be as we move forward with the new <laughs> films. <laughs> <and> the... <laughs> At, least <laughs> At least on this timeline. At least on this timeline. On this timeline, Mr. Lobo is on the other timeline. <laughs> 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 yes. We'll have Lobo for the Tim Burton film. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note <laughs> um we are going to switch gears um uh some some sad news to share with you all uh if you know about uh well actually lord blood rob uh since you've worked with him before please uh let our viewers know about our uh, loss that fandom has recently received. Yeah, uh, it's a huge loss to the horror community, to horror, uh, the study of horror history, to um, the, the, the study of film history. On uh, January 1st, David J. Skull was uh, killed in a, a car accident. And um, he was just an incredible font of of knowledge it, most of you would probably know him from the original dvd releases of the universal monster films he did the documentaries on mm -hmm. those on dracula frankenstein the mummy invisible okay. man all of them but um he wrote uh the monster show which is an a, a cultural history of horror which is an amazing uh analysis of uh 
American Horror Cinema. Yeah, there you go. That's the that's the cover right there of amazing amazing analysis of horror cinema throughout the decades and how the events of those decades affected horror. He did um, Death Makes a Holiday, a cultural history of Halloween, uh, Dark Carnival, which is the definitive novel on um, on the director Todd Browning. Uh, he is the man who discovered the Spanish version of Dracula after it was thought to be a lost film and, uh, you know, popularized it and had it and, and was the driving force behind having it restored. He's the man who restored the line uh, in the name of God. Now I know what it feels like to be God in 1931's Frankenstein. Originally, it was in the name of God and an, an or orgasmic shudder by calling <laughs> uh that line was cut because it was considered blasphemous he and uh don glute who was another great fan of horror uh don glute had had an original record found it uh, uh david skull brought it to universal now it's included in all the releases just a, a pivotal figure in horror and we lost him on january 1st and um uh, as a tribute to David Skull, um, the Nostalgia Network is repeating the Nerve Rack and Theater's 2023 uh, uh, Halloween special in which I showed um, Dracula 31, Frankenstein 31, and there's running commentary through throughout with uh, David Skull. And I guarantee you, um, you will learn things about both of those films watching this that that you won't have known before and david was just such a wonderful um generous man with his time uh there's all yeah, i use maybe at most 25 percent of the actual interviews i did with him uh uh in that episode it was just just an incredible font, font of knowledge, wonderful guy. He will definitely be missed. And um, the repeat of the Halloween special is next Saturday, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, and then again at uh, 2 a.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Pacific on the Nostalgia Network. It's a, it's a four-hour special because it's a double feature. Oh, wow. And, uh, Thanks. Yeah. Is it available to stream or is it? It uh, uh, the Nostalgia Network is on uh, Roku, Distro, Fire Stick. Right. Um, I mean, the, um, the the episode itself is it available separately to stream? No, I'm no, sorry. because of the broadcast rights. No, you hmm. know, this this episode of Planet Eight is going to drop on January twenty second. Oh well, then you you missed it by two days. So, <laughs> hey, yeah. it was really good though. <laughs> it was good. Though. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Unfortunate, um, but uh, yeah, re rest in peace, David. It's um, he was a great guy. I I was, I felt very lucky to consider him a friend. Yeah, it's definitely a shock. I met him at Lord Bloodraw's Creatures Con, had him sign my horror show book, and uh, and I actually went on Amazon and ordered the Halloween book. I actually had some credits. I got it for free, but nice. That's that should be coming. I think uh, by next weekend, but. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the horror show book I've used numerous times for numerous episodes that we've done just for research. And, and yes, I definitely remember him from all the universal documentaries, especially the documentaries and, and, uh, things he did for Creature from the Black Lagoon for that set. So, oh yeah, definitely going to be, definitely going to be missed. Yeah, mm -hmm. at, at that Creatures Con, I did a panel with him and came off the stage just bouncing off the walls. There is no one that I enjoy talking horror with more than more than him because you can just automatically feel his exuberance for the subject, and I, I'm deeply into it too. So we shared this kind of you know bond over that. It was just um, wonderful. It's great. May he rest in peace. Seventy one years young. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So far, far, far too early. Well, and the whole way things happened, I just drunk driving somebody not controlling their input and okay. crashing into it. I knew you. Yeah, it's just terrible. But yeah, the monster show is such. I I got that book. I want to say in like 2010, 2011. Um, 
the university where I work was having a library book sale. So I got a very nice hardback copy of that. And I, I just devoured that book. I had never seen anybody uh, write about horror the way he did and the way he contextualized it for the, the time it was in just fascinated me. And and like Bob said, I, I go back to it all the time, you know, and especially now that we do the, the podcast and since we've been doing the podcast, just looking up his ideas on things and getting information and yeah, it's just so tragic. I, so well, I think the key to his that. writing was a lot of times you'll read an article or you read a book on horror or science fiction or whatever, and the author actually writes in an apologetic manner. You know, like it's really, they'll say something about a movie and then they'll kind of put a little side swipe at it or whatever. But when you read David's books, that love of horror comes through and he's like unapologetic and he just, you know, tells it like it is and tells how he feels. And, you know, it's not like, it's not like he's embarrassed to be writing what he's writing about. Yeah. Yeah. He looks at it from uh, an academic uh, viewpoint, but it's never coldly academic. There's it's an affinity. A, of a deep love and interest for the genre. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And respect. And respect, yes. Yeah. Well, he will be missed. Um, hey, let's get the show uh, going. Um, actually, Lord Blood Raw, we have you uh, with us. Why don't you share with us some uh, things that are coming up uh, and where uh, viewers and listeners can find you. Well, as always, the TV series Lord Blood Raw's Nerve Rack and Theater airs on the Nostalgia Network at its usual time, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific, and then again at 2 a.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Pacific. That's the Nostalgia Network on Roku, Distro, Fire Stick, all over the place. Um, I have the podcast, Lord Blood Draws Nerve Rack and Auditorium, which uh, features uh, the best in old-time radio horror, as well as um, uh, Captain Paxar's Star Cadet Hour, which... Um, uh, features episodes of Captain Zero, Flash Gordon, all of that. That stuff can be found on YouTube. You can find um, all of the stuff I just mentioned on YouTube, in fact, at, you know, lordbloodraw.com. Or, I'm sorry, youtube.com slash lordbloodraw. Uh, and if you sign up on my Patreon at patreon.com slash lordbloodraw, you'll get um, a lot of bonus materials, including behind the curtains of the Nerve Rack and Theater in which I go a little bit more in depth into each of the um, old time radio horror episodes that, uh, that I do give you a little background on the series, the actors, the writers and things like that. And that's at uh, patreon.com slash Lord blood If you sign up there, you're also uh, supporting the production of all of the shows I've mentioned previously, and you'll get a lot of other bonus content as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Bob, what, yes. what what has come across the chief engineer's desk since last we met? What have you been listening to? What have you been watching? Share with us, regale us, if you will. Well, we were talking before the episode about the fact that uh, at least Larry and I finished up Monarch, which uh, we thoroughly enjoyed. And we'd love to talk about the ending and everything else, but <laughs> half of us haven't seen it. So... <laughs> Well, I, I will say I, I was pleasantly surprised, and this is one of those barometers in in the Casa de Caicos. When Jasmine puts her phone down to look at the TV, <laughs> something big happened to, to grab her attention. <laughs> something big is going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> but I tell you, I was uh, you know off camera. I was talking to Bob, and I'm I'm a little more excited about Godzilla X Kong. Uh, coming up in March after watching uh, this okay. series, Monarch. There's yeah, there's another little movie out there, Godzilla Minus One, which is, as of this recording, is just about to pass the $100 million box office mark, which yeah. is amazing for a foreign subtitled film. And uh, it's just doing gangbusters. And they just released it in Japan and black and white. Yeah. And uh, because it's that kind of a period piece 
And it's a prequel, basically, well, not a prequel, but it happens before the 1954 film. So they decided to do it in black and white. And so they didn't just convert it to black and white. Yamazaki, the director, went through every single scene and made sure that everything was tuned in just right. And so we're kind of hoping, beyond all hope, that maybe that black and white version will pop up in theaters over here. Or if not, it'll be on the uh, home video release. You're absolutely right, Bob. I mean, people are like, well, I'll get the DVD and I'll just tone down the color on my TV set. No, he's going into the textures and, and you know, the shadows. And, oh, man, I, I really hope we get that here. Uh, I'll go out and watch it again. <laughs> now, on, on Monarch, would you suggest seeing that series before uh, Kong X Godzilla comes out? I mean, does it give you more background oh. on the film or... It takes place between 1952 and about 2017. Oh, 17, yeah. So it's basically kind of a sequel to the 2014 Guzzle. In fact, it opens up very shortly after Guzzle's uh, battle in San Francisco with the Mutos. Okay. Right. So there's no Mothra yet. There's no Rodan. There's no Ghidra None of that. So it, it, a lot of it is how Monarch got started, right, Bob? How it got started and how it got corrupted as it went on. Right. Yeah. There you go. And so, you know, it basically, if anything, it kind of leads into Godzilla King of the Monsters and Skull Island would have, would have happened like in the midst of all these time changes and things that are in the series. So. I would say you don't have to, Lord Blood Raw, but, you know, it's kind of like you don't have to watch the Obi-Wan series before you watch, sure. like, Return of the Jedi or, sure. you know, something like that. If you do, you get a little extra. If you don't, eh, you know. Okay. Okay. Interesting. But it's fun and, and, and exciting. And Kurt Russell and his son, such a great Yeah, that's the amazing thing, because Kurt Russell is playing Lee Shaw, present day or in 2015, 17, whatever. Yeah. And uh, his son, Wyatt, is playing the same character, Lee Shaw, back in the 50s. Right. So, um, yeah, it's just, I mean, their mannerisms, their characteristics, all that, so similar. So, yeah, you can totally believe it's the same character throughout. Absolutely. It's very cool. Um, Other than that... Um, we did watch uh, Echo. Me, me, me uh, did too. Which I thought was pretty good. Debbie really loved it. So, um, so you know, Treacher, you know, it's a good step in the right direction, I guess, because uh, it wasn't Kevin Feige. I guess it was uh, Iker, was it? The, Bob the Iker. Bob Iker. It's basically put the hammer down and said, we have to start doing this more for story than message. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rather than we're going to make the superhero, we're going to make them, you know, they're going to make them Latina and gay. And, you know, it's like, no, you do the story. And then whatever kind of character fits in that story, that's what you put in there. But the emphasis has to be on the story because it seems like in a lot of the Marvel films and things lately, the emphasis has been trying to sandwich in all these different types of characters. So, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a big fan of the Kingpin, and 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 I was not disappointed. Okay, I've only <laughs> seen three episodes. So... Okay, we say no more. We say no more. <laughs> um, well, you do know one of my favorite heroes was in it. Yes, because he was in the first episode. So. Okay, yep. and we say no more. So I, I haven't seen any of it. So uh, other than that, um, I've kind of steered Debbie into starting. We're starting to binge on Touchwood, Torchwood. I'm sorry, Torchwood. So uh, yeah, and I for, I haven't seen Torchwood in a long time, so I forgot how good it was and how much I enjoyed it first time around. So I'm reliving and enjoying it once more. Cool. 
for those who don't know, Torchwood was a spinoff from Doctor Who, which I was never really a big Doctor Who fan, but Captain Jack Harkness, the head of Torchwood, he was in like half a dozen episodes of Doctor Who before Torchwood became its own series. And I've, well, I've never seen any episodes of Torchwood, but it's more of a gothic. No, it's modern day. No, but I mean, it, it, it is it more of a horror bent to it? I had it's kind of it's kind of like X Files or okay. Supernatural okay. or whatever. Torchwood is an organization that is based in Cardiff over in England, mm. and there's a a riff that basically brings in all these demons and monsters and whatever. Oh. And you have to deal with them each week. Okay. And later on the series, there were more like full storylines rather than individual episodes. But um, yeah, it's, it's very good. And just as a side, back when they were shooting Doctor Who, they didn't want to, when they were carrying film canisters across, <clears throat> across the studios, they didn't want to have Doctor Who written on those canisters. So they took, if you spell out Doctor Who, not DR, but Doctor, and you jumble up the letters, you can make Torchwood. So I used to say Torchwood on these film canisters. And uh, so when they made this series and all that, or they had this organization pop up, they said, oh, let's just call it Torchwood. Torchwood, coincidentally, you could spell out Sphincter Song, but Torchwood was the better uh, decision. <laughs> so yes, we were watching Torchwood. <laughs> And, On that note, Walker, what what have you been watching or listening or what has come across your desk well, lately? Amazon delivery. Hopefully my dogs will let me talk here. Um, <laughs> what have we been watching? Uh, oh, dear God. Now I'm, I'm all verklempt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, watching a little bit of Echo, a lot of non-genre crap that I'm not really interested in. <laughs> <laughs> um, me too <laughs> I just sit there I'm, then I, I'm like Jasmine I'm just like on my phone yeah, basically. yeah whatever um, Reacher Reacher is interesting oh, I think that's the, really good the first season I think is much more entertaining than the second but mm -hmm. I'm still one episode now shy of yeah because it's coming out every week so waiting for that um, I gotta get back on the invaders I want to start watching yeah. that me too i've been cranking um, along with the invaders so we will have an invaders episode coming up once we all watch the whole series do, absolutely trying to do more get more reading into my life uh so i just finished i got the paul mccartney book the lyrics for christmas just finished that that's a fabulous book if you want any more insights into his songwriting the beatles breakup how he felt about john etc um, very interesting book, and I just started a. The we did, we did tie that into Planet Eight last time, mm -hmm. bringing up Magneto and Titanium Man and right uh, comics. So, <laughs> and then I started a, a sci-fi novel, the latest Murderbot book by Martha Wells, and the title I think it's System Override. Um, which, if anybody's interested in reading sci-fi, I would recommend the Murderbot series. It's very good. And then I was just thinking ape-wise, one of my favorite ape items that oh, I have, nice. my lawgiver statue by Mecca, no, NECA. And I don't really remember when this came out, but this was a honking, heavy, great thing that I have around. So just sharing that for those of you on YouTube, you can see it. Those of you not on YouTube, just imagine it. Use your imagination, <laughs> kids. So does it ever uh, does it ever bleed or shed a tear or anything? Uh, <laughs> only when I've been eating mushrooms, <laughs> <laughs> or if there are mutants around, or yeah. Well, very good. Thank you, Walker. Uh, yours truly. This is from Christmas. Those of you on YouTube, uh -huh. this is the new Mego version of Captain Pike. It's based on actor Anson Mount. And Marty Abrams approves. <laughs> I don't approve because the hair is not tall enough. Well, you know, you could always put like a cotton ball on top and kind of fluff it a little, I guess. 
Also, uh, the ultimate character guide to Marvel's Avengers. And this little tome, uh, you know, if you ever wanted to know the difference between Loki and Machine Man, uh, th this is the comic book Avengers. I thought ever crossed my mind before. Yeah, well, you know, those of you on YouTube watching on YouTube, and if you're not watching on YouTube and seeing these fun pictures, log on to YouTube and subscribe. Uh, Veil and Venom, if you ever wanted to know. Uh, anyway, I'm having a lot of fun with this book. And, you know, watching the watching the shows that, that we uh, talked about already, which has been a lot of fun. Looking forward to our brand new episode coming February 8th. Uh, but until then, Lord Bloodroth, thank you again very much for joining us, sir. Thank you. Al always a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Yes, and uh, you know, there's there's another ape movie coming out this year, so who knows? We may need to beam you back over to uh, Planet 8 to discuss. Gladly. I am, based on the trailer, I am very much looking forward to the next film. Indeed. And we still have that cartoon and that TV show. and yeah. Oh, that is true. And that Bernie. is true. And Rise and uh, Dawn War. We, we have a plethora of apes to discuss. Mm -hmm. Uh, any last minute words, any thoughts before we sign out? We are living in a golden age for the genre. Agreed. And a, the incredible Godzilla content, ape content, Star Wars content, Star Trek content. And it's everything really in between. Amazing. And everything in between. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wonderful. You know, pick pick and choose what you like and uh and enjoy it because you know we're we're exactly. in a exactly or science fiction golden age. And you know, and just because someone doesn't like what you like doesn't mean you shouldn't like it. Right. Love it, support it. Right. That's your right. Absolutely. And and share it with other people because you never know who's going to be like, oh wow, I didn't know about that. Let me let me check that out. Or let me that that's why we do the sensor sweep is just to share with you guys things that that you know we dig. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the beauty of it all is that if you don't like the new stuff. You have total access to all the old stuff. Exactly. exactly. Whether it's by disc or streaming or whatever. Last night I watched uh, the latest episode of Creature Features, and they had an Irwin Allen movie, The Flood. I'll have to check that out. It's on the Robert list. Paul was in there, and Marvin Milner, and Carol Lindley. A lot of, a lot of stalwarts. Roddy McDowell was in it. Roddy McDowell. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. All right, my friends. Thank you all once again to you out there listening and supporting us. Thank you. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. Until we meet again, this is Planet 8 signing off. Peace out. On that note, this will conclude this transmission from Planet 8. We would like to thank all of our intergalactic audience for listening. Be sure to head on over to our website at www.planetatepodcast.com where you can get more information on this episode's topic. For more conversation, find us on Twitter at Planet 8 Cast. Or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Planet 8 Podcast. We want to thank you guys for tuning in each and every episode. We look forward to your input and opinions. Until next time, this is Planet 8, signing off. End transmission. By George, he's got it. It is the end.